Buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos entonces al foro sobre educación médica. Les presento entonces a Howard May, él viene de la Universidad de Toronto de la Universidad de Toronto en Canadá y él es el jefe de residentes del Hospital de Toronto. Eh, entonces él nos trae una presentación y nos va a contar un poquito como de cómo funciona el sistema de salud y la educación médica en Canadá. Eh, y ya pues al final pueden hacer pues como todas las preguntas que quieran. Él, él, él habla muy poco español, entonces los que puedan hacer las preguntas en inglés, maravilloso. Y si no, pues vamos a tratar de traducirlo. Eh, bienvenido, Howard. Welcome, Howard. Hi, everybody. My name is Howard. I'm a resident at the University of Toronto. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to have me here and present to you guys about medical education in Canada. I arrived in Colombia a few days ago, so I'm still getting uh, to understand Colombia, starting to understand a little bit of the culture and the language. So if something doesn't sound right to you, please ask questions. Please correct me. I'm here to learn from you as well, okay? So if you have any questions, feel free to just put up your hand and uh, let me know. Um, just a little bit of background about why I'm here. So I, I was traveling. Uh, I, I got tired of working, and I needed a break. And so that's why I came to Colombia. And I really like South America. I was in Chile last year, had a great time in Patagonia. And so, and uh, my buddy, Luis Chaparro, uh, who is at the same hospital as me, he invited me to come here and share some ideas with you guys and also to learn a little bit from you as well. So currently, I am a fourth year uh, resident at the University of Toronto, and I completed my medical school training at the University of Toronto. Um, and I feel like I can offer some insight about our training uh, from a medical student perspective as well as a resident's perspective because of my involvement previously with the medical student associations and with the resident associations. So I've been involved at the undergraduate level, so the medical student level for anesthesia training, and at the resident level for anesthesia training, where we talk a lot about curriculum, where we talk about the rotations, and we talk about the, uh, the learning experience of the medical students and the residents. I also was involved in a lot of uh, medical school programs uh, because we have 17 schools in Canada, and we have uh, oh, we try to do a lot of um, collaborative work between the universities so that we can have a very good experience for the students. Now today, I think our goal here is to talk about the differences and also the similarities between our systems to show you how we train in uh, in anesthesia in Canada, and perhaps we can learn a little bit from each other about what works well and what doesn't work well, or maybe we can get some of you guys to come to Canada and join us in our anesthesia program there. So undergraduate medical education, um, our, our training is different is in that after we do high school, and after high school, we do undergraduate studies. We don't go into, um, we don't go into uh, medicine right away. So some of us will do three years of undergraduate studies. Some of us will do four years of undergraduate studies. Some of them, us will also do a master's or a PhD before we gain admission to medical school. And medical school is, for the most part, four years in Canada. Some schools have three. And after that, we do residency training, as you guys are doing right now. So the shortest residency we have is two years for uh, family medicine or general practice, just as you have here. And for everything else, it's about five to six years. Whether you do surgery, five years. 
anesthesia, five years. If you do internal medicine, we have general internal medicine for three years, and then you can specialize in cardiology, gastroenterology, and that's anywhere from two to three years. And then after that, everything is becoming more and more specialized. Everything is becoming, uh, you know, you need to know more, you need to train more. And as a result, many places to work, they're asking for us to do fellowships. And fellowships may mean clinical fellowships, where you're there to learn a technique, learn a skill, learn some knowledge. Or it can mean research fellowships, where you're there in the lab, or you're there doing clinical research. So when you add it all up, you have four years of undergraduate studies, four years of medical school, five years of residency, fellowships, everything else, we're looking at 15 years after high school for us before we go into independent practice, which is very, very long. For many of us, we're not practicing on our own until we're about 35 years or older. The toughest part about getting into the medical school system or the medical system for us is probably medical schools. Uh, this, there's some data here from the province of Ontario where Toronto is part of. Uh, this is 2015. There were less than 1,000 spots and there were almost 7,000 applicants. So for almost seven people, one person gets accepted. And of course, similar to you guys, I'm sure the reasons for why we went into medicine is because we want to treat people. We want to help people, and it's exciting, it's challenging. In the Western world, or at least in Canada, physicians are also seen as, uh, you know, people uh, with status, people with uh, respect, and so that's why many people decide to go uh, into medicine. In terms of our training in Canada, we have something called can meds so it's a uh, it's a it's a training system where there's different aspects of how we see a physician should be in the middle of it there's the medical expert because underneath it all we need to have the medical knowledge to be able to practice medicine but surrounding it in the petals you see a communicator, a collaborator, leader, health advocate, scholar, and a professional. So in your years of training, the expectation is that we will have that, we will gain the medical knowledge as we go through the system. That is the basic. But on top of that, we need to learn how to communicate with each other, with our colleagues, with our patients, how to do it professionally. Right. We also work in a team environment with our surgeons, with the nurses, and how do we work as a team to do what's best for the patients, to do what's safest for the patients. Right. And there's also challenges in our medical field where we need to be leaders, where we need to find solutions to problems. For example, if you have surgical site infections, how do we reduce that? And that may come from the surgeons, that may come from us as the anesthesiologist, that may come from the nurses, but we try to foster that environment to make these uh, differences. And of course, also being a scholar to do research, to do education, to make these presentations, and to share our knowledge. That's also part of it. And health advocate is, uh, is advocating for your patients. So if you think they need the help, they need the surgery, they need the treatment, it's your job as the physician to speak on their behalf, to give them a voice when sometimes they don't have that. So medical school is, uh, for us at least in the, at the University of Toronto, is probably very similar to what you guys have. 
you know, we learn about anatomy, we learn about embryology, histology, biochemistry, physiology, very basic things, things that you guys would have covered as well in your first couple of years of medical school. In the second year, we learn about the diseases. So we go chapter by, uh, sorry, or we go system by system. So in the brain, what are the mechanisms of these diseases? How do we manage them? and what are the manifestations. We go through the body systems, but we also have other courses that we, we take, like clinical skills, where we learn how to do a history on a patient, or how we do a clinical examination on a patient. And as part of giving back to the community, we also do community health to learn about what we can do to prevent disease and to better the health of our community in general. In year three, we learn, we do rotations, clinical rotations, uh, and we try to cover all the different, different um, specialties. So internal medicine, general surgery, family medicine, psychiatry, and it goes on and on. Every school does it a little bit differently. So some schools will have a week of radiology, other schools will not have that and have a week of ophthalmology. So it's very much so school dependent, but at the end of the day, the general things that physicians are expected to see, we see that during our third year of, uh, of medical school. And then at the end of medical school is when we make the decisions to, to specialize or not. So we have some time called elective time. We can go to the different universities, follow different doctors to see what specialty fits, is a good fit for us and what specialty we want to work in. So we look at the type of work, the hours for the work that they do, you know, how do they do their daily activities? Is that something we can do for the rest of our lives? And so that's the time where we get to uh, experience some of that. It's also a time where we go meet these uh, physicians and meet people from the program to get us reference letters and let us gain entry into the program. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but we sometimes use this as a joke to decide which specialty we go into. So for example, there's crazy and there's sing. Right? Crazy was when you, crazy, right? Local. Um, and so if you have a short attention span, you do emergency medicine, right? Because they go see patient after patient after patient after patient. And the, so the joke about anesthesia is that we are sane people. If you look on the right side, we are, where are we? We are hardworking people, right? And we have, well, the attitude we are, it doesn't really matter, is what it says here. And then between dead patients or patients that are asleep, we prefer the patients that are asleep. So as a joke, this is how we decide our future. Now for the residency uh, application, it's, um, it's interesting, it's unique. There are 17 training programs in Canada. Each school has spots for each of the specialties. Um, and what we do in fourth year is we go visit these schools and we apply through something called the Canadian Resident Matching Service. So you do your letters of reference, you do your interviews, you show them your scores during your medical school, and then they rank you. They rank you based on how much they think you're going to succeed in their program or how much they like you. You also rank the schools. So one list for the schools and one list for us. And then the computer generates who goes where. So if I like, uh, if I like the University of Antiochia, but University of Antiochia does not like me, it means 
they're probably going to pick somebody else after this computer does its uh, work. And when we make these decisions, we try to choose what specialty we want to go into and also the location. And so that's how the match works for us. And in terms of program location, we think about the specialty, we think about where it is. It's also uh, important to think about the training exposure. For example, in Toronto, where I train, we have five or six million people in the greater Toronto area. So there's going to be a lot of exposure to many different types of cases. Uh, whereas in somewhere that's smaller in Canada, you may not get that exposure. And different schools have time set aside for research, time set aside for other things. So as part of going to every school, we learn about their programs and we decide what's best for us. As I got to understand a little bit about anesthesia here in uh, Colombia, is that it's, uh, you know, the specialty trainings are all very competitive. And that is the same in, uh, in Canada. There's about 100 or so spots in anesthesia residency in Canada every year. 20 of those, or just under 20, are at the University of Toronto. And there are often over 100 people that apply for residency spots, uh, for, for anesthesia. So for each spot in anesthesia, there's often more than one applicant. Okay, so it's quite competitive. And when we think about these specialty um, programs, we have something called the road specialties. So radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesia, and dermatology, we call those the lifestyle specialties, where your hours are good, your pay is good, many, many people want to uh, join this specialty. In other ones that are very competitive, plastic surgery, emergency medicine, uh, uh, some of the subspecialty surgeries are very competitive, like vascular surgery or thoracic surgery. And for us, there is quite a bit of myth about how this matching system works uh, because it does determine what you end up practicing in the future. And actually, I was part of this interview uh, when I was going through it as a fourth year medical student. Um, and this was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Uh, and I gave my opinion that it's, you know, it's very unclear about how they do this. But at the end of the day, it works out for most of us. So in terms of our postgraduate training, it's a five-year marathon. It's not three years that you have here, and it's not three years like they have in China. This is uh, a very long time for us, so we take it slow. In first year, we do something called an internship year, or very similar to an internship year like they have in the United States. We do some medicine, we do some surgery, some obstetrics, emergency medicine, a bit of everything, just so that we can learn about it all and so we can integrate that into our practice. In year two, we do one whole year of anesthesia so that we can learn the skills, we have the knowledge, and provides us the foundation for further practice. Year three is when we still do some anesthesia, but also do subspecialty anesthesia. So some exposure to regional anesthesia, some exposure to cardiac anesthesia, and all the other subspecialties. But we also do a lot of training in medicine and ICU. So we spent in total during these five years about six months in, uh, in ICU training. And we often don't like these months because they're hard work, they're long hours, um, and it's, you know, it's not the same as giving an anesthetic in the operating room. But we also do a lot of medicine. We spend a lot of time on cardiology, respirology, 
nephrology, endocrinology, all the other uh, medicine subspecialties that are important to our practice. And we do that in year four as well. And then in year five, we do mostly anesthesia and do some more subspecialty anesthesia. The difference, as I understand, is that when you guys graduate, you guys don't have to write an exam. Is that correct? Yeah, right? No exams. For us, we have a big, big exam. We have to do it. If we don't pass it, it means we can't practice anesthesia by ourselves. So we spend all of fifth year preparing for this exam. There's a written exam, a portion, and an oral portion of the exam. So it's a lot of, um, a lot of stress and a lot of work that goes into it. In terms of our hospital sites, we have many, many, many hospitals affiliated with the University of Toronto. Um, and there's just some pictures here. Uh, and so, for example, the one on the top left is Women's College. It's mainly an ambulatory center. So for clinics, for same-day surgeries, we do a lot of that. The one in the middle there is Toronto General Hospital. A lot of transplants, lung transplants, heart transplants, very sick patients there. And that's where we do a lot of training for, uh, for advanced uh, anesthesia. We also have Sunnybrook and St. Mike's. And these are two centers that have a lot of traumas. So all the shootings, all the car accidents, all the stabbings, they go to these places. And it's a great experience. At the bottom left there, we have um, Toronto Western Hospital, where they do a lot of focus on neuroanesthesia and regional anesthesia. Uh, I understand some of the professors there, uh, Dr. Peng and Dr. Chan, are coming to Columbia uh, as part of uh, one of the organizations. I think it might be ASRA, and they're doing some workshops here. The one in the middle and the bottom there is SickKids Hospital, and that's where I am currently, where we do pediatrics. Um, and so everyone under 18 years of age is where they come to go over there for specialized surgeries. And then the one on the bottom right is Mount Sinai, and that's where we have general, general practice and also a lot of uh, obstetrics a lot of obstetrics, and they're often complicated cases as well. And so that's the group of residents that are currently there at a at Hospital for Sick Children. And you can see that our uh, our friend there, uh, Louis Chaparro, is uh, at the end, and I'm at the other end. And uh, we're just hanging out before our rotation started. This is July 1st of this year. So a typical day for us is uh, is probably similar to what you guys have, um, is we would come to the operating room for about 6.30 in the morning. So every day we set up the room. And I understand that's a big difference compared to you guys, where you have nurses that do the preparations for you. Right? Yeah? OK, good. So the, 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 am I right? Did I, do I have this right? The nurses prepare things for you. Yeah? M medications, all that stuff. The nurses prepare. We do it ourselves. We show up early. We draw up the propofol. We draw up all the emergency medications. If we want, uh, you know, like a warmer line or something else, we set up on our own. And so we take about half an hour every day to you know prepare the tube, prepare the drugs, make sure our machine's working, all of that. Okay, that's part of our training. At seven o'clock, uh, that's where we learn a lot of. Uh, we we have teaching every day, or pretty much every day, and so it would be on a topic like a disease or a difficult airway, or we talk about something uh, about a challenging case and how we would give the anesthetic or how we would prepare the patient for the anesthetic. And so that's half an hour every day. And 7.30 is when we do our patient assessment. So you see the patient in the, uh, in the holding area. So you can 
uh, take your history, do your physical examinations. And at 7.45, 8 o'clock is when the, op uh, the operating room starts working, right? And every morning you get together, the anesthesiologist, the nurse, the surgeon, we get together, we talk about the patients that are coming up for the day, any challenges, any special equipment, anything else that we need to do that, that, that requires uh, some extra attention. And once it starts, it just goes, goes until your list is finished for the day. So for us trainees in some of the academic hospitals, the cases are slow. For example, uh, how long does it take for you guys uh, to sit through a laparoscopic appendectomy? Give me a time. Three hours. Yeah? So it's, it's a long time. And we take, you know, for us it's an hour and a half, two hours sometimes is how long it takes for a laparoscopic appendectomy. In the community hospitals, the smaller hospitals where sometimes they don't get the sick patients as much, they do it in half an hour. They do it in 40 minutes, right? So it's a lot of quick turnovers. And so at the academic centers where we are as trainees, we take a long time because the surgical resident's a trainee, we are trainees, so everything is much slower. And so the, the, the productivity is a little bit low. Every morning, we generally get a coffee break. So about 15 minutes, uh, our staff comes in, we leave the operating room, we go to the bathroom, we go get some coffee, uh, and we relax for a little bit of time. Okay? Then you come back and then you continue. And the staff may be there when you're doing the induction, the staff may be there when you're doing the extubation, um, or when you're doing some procedures. Um, and then at noon or lunchtime, they come back in, let you out, you get half an hour or so for lunch, um, and, then, uh, and then you carry on with the rest of the day. And generally, you're booked for, you know, the OR stops at 3.30, 4 o'clock. Some days there are late rooms that go until 5 or 5.30, um, but when we finish, we look up our patients for the next day. Is that something you guys do here? Do, 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 so, so when you have a list of patients for, uh, for tomorrow, do you read about them, read about their medical issues? You see the schedule. But you don't look at, for example, their medical history or their uh, C, if you want to, okay. The expectation for us is we do all of that the day before. Uh, the expectation is that if this patient is in the hospital, you go see that patient the day before. So you get to know the patient, you understand their medical problems, and if there's anything to improve, to optimize for them before coming to the surgery, you would arrange for that. So that is the expectation for us. And so some days, you know, we may finish our OR at 5 or 6 o'clock, but then we still have a patient in the hospital we need to go see. So that could easily turn into an 11 or 12 hour day uh, for us, unfortunately. Do you guys have any questions about a regular day that we have? We also do on-call. I'd imagine you have something similar, similar here, is where we, someone needs to work overnight, basically. And some of the hospitals, the busy hospitals, have 16-hour shifts, whereas the less busy hospitals will be working for 24 hours straight. So for the busy hospitals, we have someone during the day, so from 7 o'clock until 5 o'clock, there's someone who's carrying the code pager and all the other things. Um, and then someone at 5 o'clock comes on and works until 8 a.m. the next morning, right? Um, because someone needs to work overnight. And so our responsibilities overnight uh, might involve being in the operating room and giving the anesthetic. 
it may mean that we're seeing a consult, so a patient who is sick and is going needs an operation, but they're medically complex, and so we need to assess them to see if they need an ICU bed after or if they need any medications to help them to optimize for the operating room. There's also code blues, so resuscitations we need to go to. There's also traumas we need to go to. Um, some hospitals have obstetrics, so epidurals, spinals for C-sections. Uh, some hospitals, we also cover acute pain, so someone after surgery needs an IVPCA or, uh, you know, some need some extra pain medications, we get called for those as well. So there's lots of things we do while on call to uh, to kind of cover the clinical responsibilities. And we have to do this uh, maximum seven times every four weeks. So it, it's, it can feel like a lot of being on call because 24 hours is a long time to work and you get the next day to sleep and the day after that you're back at work. But the maximum we can do is seven times each month, which is, it's okay. We also do resident presentations. So Louise told me that this is very different than what you guys have. Um, my understanding is that you guys will have to make a presentation and teach each other quite frequently. Uh, I think once or uh, once a month or once every other month. For us, we do about eight to ten presentations during residency um, and we do it on our anesthesia rotations where we present an anesthesia topic and we share it with our colleagues and the professors. Um, and then when we're on medicine, so when we're on cardiology or on respirology, we also do a lot of those presentations as well. So this past year when I was on cardiology, I did the Canadian uh, uh, cardio, uh, cardiology society guidelines for perioperative cardiac risk assessment. And so something related to anesthesia, but also something related to cardiology. And then on my other rotations, I have a lot of interest in uh, cannabis, cannabis and pain. And so that's where I talk a lot about my uh, research and my work in that field. University of Toronto also has a tremendous reputation in research. Um, we publish a lot, and Louis uh, has published a lot um, over the last few years uh, while we've both been at, at U of T. Um, and as you can see here, we our reputation in research is right after Harvard, so we're second in the world when it comes to that, and a lot of uh, big, big players in anesthesia are at the University of Toronto. We, because of our reputation in research, we also have a lot of time dedicated to the, uh, to academics. So there's time to, every week, every af uh, one afternoon each week, we have dedicated lectures uh, to teach us about anesthesia, anesthesia-related problems. We also do simulations. So every year we do at least uh, one simulation where, you know, you have a mannequin, you have a dummy, and uh, we practice that on how to how to take care of emergencies. And then there's also technical skills where we will learn to do procedures and things like that. There's for some residents, if you do research, that there's protected time to pursue these research projects. Um, they could be simple as retrospective chart reviews or you can do your own randomized controlled trial or do your meta-analysis. Do something like a scholarly project because that's the expectation. So it could be in clinical science, it could be in basic science, it could be in medical education, it could be whatever. And some of my colleagues have also decided to pursue graduate studies. So they want to do a master's during residency or they want to pursue a PhD in residency. 
in that, that is possible as well, and we try to make time for that. In terms of our simulation training, we have this uh, at many hospital sites, um, but also as part of the anesthesia program is that we uh, get together. For example, the way we have it is that there's a first year resident, there's a second year, third year, and a fourth year. So there's four of us at each simulation. And uh, there would be, the first year resident would walk in and get a clinical scenario, like, uh, like, uh, like an asthma attack, right? And so how do you deal with it? There's on the screen, there's your vital signs, your heart rate, your blood pressure. There's someone over the microphone and the speaker saying, I can't breathe. And then it's, you know, you play the game of what is your assessment, what is your diagnosis, and what is your treatment. And so there's many, and we do this to prepare for some of the rare, um, rare emergencies we may have, like malignant hyperthermia like a thyroid storm, like no electricity in the OR, and how do you, how do you keep someone under anesthesia uh, when that happens? So lots of different cases and lots of different scenarios and gets us thinking, keeps us prepared for, uh, for these uh, things that might happen in real practice. As I said before, residency for us is a five-year marathon. Lots and lots of challenges. Um, for example, our work hours is pretty long. How how many hours a week do you guys work in total? In give me numbers. Sixty. A week, okay. And so if we break that down into a five-day work week, we're looking about 12, 11, 12 hours, basically, right? 12 hours, uh, sorry, 12 hours a day. And that's what we have, something similar, um, especially if you're on call for 24 hours and then you work 12-hour days, easily 60 hours. Um, and it does, it's a big issue for us. We make that, uh, we have, uh, resident associations for the province as well for the country, and we've been trying to tackle how to make it uh, less stress and less work on residents because these hours are quite heavy for us. And we've done a lot of work trying to improve that. Um, and of course, we've looked into comparisons with the pilots that fly the airplanes they're only allowed to work however many hours before it's considered unsafe for them to fly. And so we make the same comparison. How many hours do we have to work before it's unsafe for us to give an anesthetic? But the unfortunate uh, reality is currently we work pretty much the same hours as you do, 50, 60, 70 hours, depending on what kind of rotation you're on. Sleep is a bit of an issue for us. Uh, we, you know, I'm sure it's the same thing for you guys. Some of us sleep five hours, four hours. Some people can still sleep eight hours. I don't know where they find the time to sleep eight hours during residency. Um, and you're also trying to get everything else done, right? You have to do your laundry, you have to cook, you have to see family and friends. You have a life outside of anesthesia you're trying to maintain. And that's difficult. That's difficult, for sure. And on top of that, for us, we have a lot of exams. Um, like I said, in fifth year, uh, there's, um, there's that big exam, but also every year we have exams. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I think resident benefit and support is where we excel the most. We have, in my opinion, pretty good benefits and pretty good support. Uh, my understanding of the system here is that you guys either pay or don't have to pay to be part of the hospitals, um, but you don't get paid a salary for being a resident. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So. 
we get paid as residents. Uh, we have a resident association. And let me back that up. So in the healthcare system in Canada, it's the federal government that collects the taxes, and then it gives money to each of the provinces. And it's the provinces that handles how that money is spent on healthcare. So the province gives money to the universities to make a resident spot. It pays the hospitals money to have us be there and work for them and learn. They also pay us money to do the work to see the patients. Um, so that's, I think, where we are a little bit different. And so we have, for example, the Professional Association of Residents of Ontario. This is the group that bargains for us, that asks for better conditions, better work conditions, better salary, better hours. And so when I say there's a maximum of seven on calls I can do each month, that's the resident association speaking on my behalf. We also have uh, representative representation with the provincial government, and, uh, and they do a lot of the work to speak for us. And there's about, I think, about 5,000 of us residents in Ontario in all the different specialties. With our benefits, we get four weeks of holidays. We have seven days of academic time, so we can go to conferences, uh, do some research work. Uh, we also get five days during Christmas or New Year's uh, to spend time with your family or go on a trip. We also get a lot of coverage for health and dental. So if you need a prescription and uh, that's not covered by our healthcare system, this private insurance for us will pay for it. If you need a massage, you go see a massage therapist and the insurance company will pay for that. Need your teeth cleaned, they will pay, I think, 85% of it. So the coverage is pretty good uh, for us. And they do a lot of help for us, too, uh, in other areas. So for example, they have problems coping with residency. You want someone to talk to, they have someone on the phone that you can talk to. They have counseling, they have, their goal is to make us succeed, right? We are the future of healthcare uh, in Colombia and in Canada, and they want us to be healthy. And we also have uh, a lot of social events for the residents. So we organize events for people of all different specialties to come together, to uh, have a drink, to have fun, and to, uh, complain about our uh, everyday work kind of thing, right? It's a, it's a nice social environment. And so there's lots of uh, regulatory bodies, and I think that's also where we differ. So there's the Ontario Medical Association, which is a body that, uh, that deals with the government uh, on our behalf out of all the physicians in Ontario. We also have the Canadian Medical Association, which is the federal uh, federal uh, organization. We also have the CMPA, so the Canadian Medical Protective Association. So we pay insurance to CMPA to cover us for any uh, any medical liabilities that we accumulate or we run into. And then there's also the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, where each province has their own. So it's to make sure that you have your medical license, you can do the work that you're supposed to do, and you do it safely. Right? So they do a lot of monitoring to make sure that you are doing your job right. On the right side, this is our fee structure for residents, and there's been an update since then. So in our first year, we make about $55,000, $56,000 uh, Canadian dollars every year. And the further along in training you go, the more you make. So at the PGY-5, so at the end of your anesthesia training, you should be making about $77,000 a year. Okay. Um, because we feel like we are not getting paid enough, we go to the government, we ask for more money. And so this past year, we actually got more money 
we got a 1.4% increase um, for each of those years. So because we stick together, we talk to the government, we, I think we've done a pretty good job in, in making our salaries better. For the days we're on call where we you know, have to stay in the hospital overnight, we also get some extra dollars for that. We get $116 uh, to do that extra bit of work on top of your salary. So, you know, you, you can, the more calls you do, the more money you will make. Um, there's also some specialties where they can stay at home, answer your phone or answer your pager, and you don't have to go into the hospital, and they'll get $58 for each time, they're, each evening that they're on call. Um, so, yeah, I, I understand that you guys don't get paid, so I feel quite privileged right now that we get paid for, for the work that we do. Same work, but and in terms of our resources, uh, we we use I think we use very similar uh, resources. So these are some of the books that uh, that are uh, on our exam that they take questions out of. So Lang's Anesthesiology and our I think the the, the textbooks that we often use are Barash and Miller, right? Clinical Anesthesia, Miller's Anesthesia. Um, and for our fifth year exam, we just read all that, we make notes, we you know, review the old questions. And for pediatric anesthesia, we use Cote, uh, obstetrics, we use Chestnut. Stolting has a couple of books that we uh, use on a, on a slightly less frequent basis. But it's, these are essentially all the resources. And on top of that, we do our readings from our journal reviews, we do readings from you know, the newest articles. And I can say that, uh, again, my colleague, Luis Shaparo, is always on top of that. He sends out many, many articles for us to read, and it's, uh, it's a great resource for all of us. Now, there's a couple of resources from Toronto that I, I think would be helpful for you guys to take a look at. Um, the bottom one is our anesthesia clerkship manual. So this is a manual initially designed for medical students, but for the first year residents, it's also a great manual. It's about, I think about 200, 300 pages, and we just came up with an ebook for it. So if you go to I, if you go to the App Store, you can actually download it for free, I believe, um, and just flip through it, and it has um, it's color, in color it has graphics, and it has everything else. So if you, know, you want a resource, I think it's a pretty good resource. There's also something called pi.med.utoronto.ca. So this is a website um, with lots of great resources. For example, uh, the top right there, we have Transparacic Echo. Um, that's something we have to, all have to learn as part of our anesthesia training. But without having to be near a patient or near a dummy, you can actually use the mouse and and move it around and get different views uh, from a TTE. And you can take away layers, for example, take away the ribs, turn the heart, see the different views. There's this for transthoracic echo, uh, transesophageal echo, uh, from bronchoscopy, uh, for many things. So you can learn how to do these virtually uh, online before you do them uh, in the OR or in a real patient. So uh, a fantastic resource and I would highly encourage you to check it out. When it comes to exams, as I've talked about before, um, we have that fifth year big, big, big exam. That's the one where we decide whether we're fit to practice on our own or not. But every year we also have written exam by our department. They come up with questions and we have to do it. And we also have an oral exam. So it's, uh, it's, they ask us a question. For example, you have a 66-year-old gentleman with this heart disease, has been bleeding, needs this type of surgery. How do you assess the patient? How do you want to optimize the patient? How will you give the patient the answer? So you have to talk it out, and so it's a bit of a mental exercise that you have to go through, um, and those can be challenging. 
and then each of our hospitals also has a, a kind of an exam. So they'll have either a written exam or a, an oral exam. And then we also do a couple of American exams, so the AKT-6 and the 24th, so the anesthesia knowledge test at six months and at 24 months. And this is something our program pays the American group for us to write um, during those two times. Just once, just once. So six months in, so uh, six months of anesthesia training. So that would be in our second year of anesthesia. In first year, we get about four months, um, and then so into our second year is when we start when we write that exam. And then the AKT 24 is 24 months of anesthesia training. So generally, in our fourth year of residency. <coughs> And so this is the Royal College and the board exam. So when we do our final exams, uh, we do it in our final year training. And like I said, there's a written and there's an oral exam. And they've also started introducing simulated cases where they put things on a screen. You have to interpret, uh, interpret that as part of uh, your answer. And it takes a very long time to prepare for this because the stakes are very high for us. Uh, we sometimes even start preparing two years in advance. High stress, high intensity, but at the end of the day, you become an independent anesthesiologist, so the reward is quite high. So in terms of additional training, as I said, things are becoming more specialized. And so people need to do more training to get the jobs that they want. And like I said, it's one year of clinical experience or maybe a year of research uh, plus clinical. And you do some teaching, you do some research. Um, but the fellowships are not very standardized uh, in terms of their application. So you can just email the different hospitals uh, for that experience. And it is the hospitals that, that hire you as the, uh, the fellows. Um, and even for us, it's quite trendy because we do learn to practice more independently, um, but still have a safety net of the staff kind of helping us if we really need it. And so, in conclusion, I, I think I've talked a lot, quite a bit today um, about our training system. Um, and, but, but basically, it's quite lengthy and it's quite challenging for us. And there's lots of different hurdles with the exams, with the challenges of residency, um, for us to become the staff and a season physician. Um, but I, I certainly would like to hear more from you if you have opinions or thoughts on how your experience uh, here is uh, so different that you wish to share that, or how we can make our system better. Um, so I'd love to hear from you guys about that. Thank you very much for listening to me. At least one research, uh, or at least one project. That's it. That's all we. It's not. It's not. And some some of my colleagues would argue that you don't even need to do the one research project to be an anesthesiologist. That if you want to be the researcher, you need to do more. But that's a that's a debate that hasn't been resolved. That's a very good question. Very good question. Um, I wish my colleague Luis Chaparro would be uh, able to answer this. Um, but at the very least, um, I, again, I think each hospital's application is a little bit different. So at the very least, they want to see proficiency in English, right? Being able to 
to converse with them, and it's also converse with the patients, you would have to have your degree, uh, your medical license, your medical degree, um, and perhaps even certification in anesthesia here in Columbia. Um, and I think the rest of it is a lot of paperwork, uh, you know, the visa, Canadian visa, and all of that. So it's, it, I think it's more paperwork than what you need to learn. And Uh, I, I think if you're English, if uh, I think some places may require the TOEFL uh, anesthesia test. No, not to my knowledge, but for at the University of Toronto, there is a requirement for all the fellows that go there to undergo a period of supervision or a period of uh, uh, where we where the staff is observing you and evaluating to make sure that you are up to the standard where we expect you to be. Um, and if you don't pass that, then that, that, that's the uh, maximum of seven. Maximum seven, seven times, yeah. But depending on how many residents we have at each site, for example, uh, I do the scheduling for, for the hospital currently, um, and we do about four or five times each month. So if we have many residents, uh, three to four. If we have very few, then up to seven. One day after, yeah, we get to sleep. Uh, so if it's the 16-hour call where you show up at 5 p.m., yeah, we I personally sleep until 10 or 11, read for a couple of hours, another nap, and then I go to work. That's a very good question. There is actually some debate about uh, whether we should go back to 24 hours and just continue with 24 hours. Um, I personally think that it would be nice to have a little bit of a break. So in the system that we have at my current hospital is that we show up in the morning and we work until 1 p.m. And between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m., we learn something from you guys or from the South Americans. We take a siesta from 1 till 5 p.m. And we can do anything. We can go take a nap. We can go do some work. Um, and then at 5 p.m. we come back and we work the rest of the day and the night. So I think that model is uh, reasonable. It only takes a few hours out of the 24-hour call. But it does give you a good, good amount of rest. And I think that would that that's probably a compromise between the two models. So we're, I'm in year four, and year five is when we write our exam. I'm starting to review some of the questions and see whether those questions are useful for when we do our exam. For sure, when we do the written, the multiple choice, or the short answer, sometimes I don't feel that it's all that relevant to when we're in actual clinical practice. But our oral exam, where we talk about here's a clinical scenario, how would you deal with it, I think that's highly relevant. And it helps us with our thought process, how we think about how we want to manage this patient. There's also, um, you know, how uh, just clinical decision making about what we should do and helps you make those decisions in those times. And I think that's an important part, uh, and I think we should have that. We all hate exams. I <laughs> we all hate exams. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, um, but I, I think it's a nice way to make you, keep you on track and keep you reading and keep you prepared. Um, but uh, yeah, it's no different in Canada. Residents hate exams. So that's also a little bit tricky because it's really dependent on how we've done before. So if I've been an A student or a B student and then I fail an exam outright, they'll say, you know, maybe something happened you can just keep on going. There's 
you know, not very little uh, repercussions for that. I mean, if you have had issues for a long time and then you continue to not do well, there's often some extra work you need to do, either readings or more frequent, smaller exams for you, um, or you might be assigned to staff who will teach you some more. Um, so there's lots of different ways of um, kind of help you through because us as residents, we are a resource uh, for the government. They put in a lot of money into our uh, education. For example, our um, medical school cost is $20,000 each year for each of the four years. And that's with the government subsidizing about 70 to 80% of it, right? So it, in reality, it costs about $100,000 for each of us to go to medical school, but the government pays for it. So the system is set up in a way where they encourage us to do well, they try to help us to do well because everyone else has invested so much into our education. And so it's, you know, they'll give you a chance to redo the exam. They'll give you a chance to read, to prepare better. They'll give you a chance to have, surround you with the better teachers, uh, you know, and that, that's uh, how they try to overcome uh, any kind of failures from the system. We do, we do. We have something called the Resident Doctors of Canada. So this is an association of all the residents within Canada, and you know, there's a lot of us. But with that uh, big organization, there's also an organization for each of the provinces. And so because healthcare is uh, delivered by the province, it's those provincial organizations that have more power and they negotiate with the government, negotiate with the health minister on, uh, on, uh, on, these, on many of the healthcare issues and also our salary, our benefits and things like that. Um, but yes, we do have a united voice and we uh, try to work on many things like resident work hours, like resident fatigue, patient safety, um, work, or, or sorry, uh, um, uh, like uh, work after residency, finding jobs, things like that. There, to my knowledge, there is not an exact number, a minimum number you need to do. Um, but, it, you know, we do have a logbook. So on our phones, we have an app, and every time we do a case, we log what kind of intubation, what kind of induction, uh, how old the patient is, ASA class, um, and, uh, and any other notes you want to make. So we do keep track. And we have a national average, we have our programs average, and we have your number. So it's a nice way for you to direct your learning. For example, if you haven't done as many cardiac cases, you want to see a few, you ask the person booking you in the operating room to put you in a cardiac case. So you can, you know, see those cases and uh, direct your own learning and feel competent or confident. Go ahead, Luis. Go ahead for what? Any questions? I, I don't. I, <laughs> I, we're just connecting with you, I think. Okay. ¿Hay alguna pregunta al auditorio? Doctor, sino que ya hicimos varias preguntas. No sé si tuvo la oportunidad de escucharlas. Sí, la verdad, escuché eh, todas las preguntas que le hicieron a, a Howard. Pero no sé si quieren que te responda alguna en particular. La idea era como que usted nos contara la experiencia que usted ha tenido pues la verdad, um, como, como algunos de ustedes recuerdan, yo me fui de Medellín uh, hace 10 años y tenía un interés particular por investigación. Entonces inicialmente llegué a Toronto con la Universidad de Toronto y después con la Universidad de Quincy. Hice un par de fellows, pero 
sobre todo enfocados en dolor crónico y, y, y también en investigación en dolor. Y de ahí, pues, el, las investigaciones o los, las publicaciones que tengo en este momento. Uh, de ahí en adelante, lo, lo que ocurrió fue que eh, intentando entrar dentro del sistema, pues, eh, eh, como no tenía la, la, la digámoslo, la parte clínica, eh, por eso el sistema, de cierta forma, me demandó eh, volver a hacer la residencia. Y aquí estoy, cuarto año ya. O sea que para poder trabajar allá como staff, debe volver a hacer la residencia, pues digamos el colombiano, aunque me han estudiado en Colombia que se quisiera ir para allá. No, no. La historia es muy diferente para cada persona. Eh, mi historia es, digámoslo, un poco más eh, lenta en el eh, Dado el caso, pues, que, que yo estaba buscando, digámoslo, como una licencia independiente y además eh, eh, tenía, pues, el interés de seguir aprendiendo y, y por eso volví a, a recurrir a, a la parte de, la, de, de hacer una residencia otra vez. Pero Nelson les puede hablar de, de la parte en la cual él, él tiene mucha mejor eh, experiencia que yo, que entró directamente a hacer el ejercicio clínico en una modalidad de feroz clínicos que él hizo y, y que en este momento pues él ya, ya tiene, digámoslo, como una licencia especial académica que, que igual lo, lo cataloga como, como un en anestesiólogo aquí en Canadá. Muchas gracias, doctor. Doctor Nelson González. Doctor Nelson. Hola. Sí, ¿me escucha? ¿Me escucha? Sí, hola, ya te escuchamos. ¿Escuchaste la pregunta? Sí, o sea, tu pregunta específica, específica es si uno necesita volver a hacer la residencia para trabajar como anestesiólogo en Canadá. La respuesta es eh, no necesariamente. Yo pienso que mm, repetir la residencia sería como, como el, el, el camino más eh, meritorio y que te va a mejorar tus posibilidades eh, laborales. Eh, en mi caso particular eh, no fue así, yo simplemente vine con la idea de adquirir eh, una formación en eh, anestesia cardiovascular y ecocardiografía y, y en trasplantes y conté pues con la suerte de que eh, para ese momento la institución tenía algunas vacantes y me ofrecieron la posibilidad de, de vincularme entonces eh, entonces eh, me contactaron como anestesiólogo eh, pero eh, la, la figura que yo tengo en, en Canadá es una figura de eh, académica, lo que implica pues que en la práctica pues eh, hago la anestesia normal eh, y todo eso, hago pues anestesiología y, y estoy vinculado a una universidad. Eh, esa licencia que yo tengo es restringida a la práctica clínica en, en, la, en las instituciones universitarias de, de mi universidad y en, la, y, y en la provincia pues en la que me encuentro pero pero no es eh, la licencia pues a la que puede aspirar quien repite la residencia que, que le da digamos como todo el margen de posibilidades para, para trabajar en el nivel que quiera eh, en, en Canadá. Entonces eso depende mucho pues como dijo el doctor Chaparro de, de las eh, expectativas y de las intenciones pues de cada, de cada quien. Muchas gracias doctor. Doctor, muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Meng, for your time. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.